Netflix's library is so vast that it's often tough to figure out what to watch. Luckily, if you know what to look for, you're bound to find a few stone-cold classics. From underrated gems to timeless favorites, these are the best movies on Netflix right now. Over the past decade, A24 Films has transformed itself from the little indie studio that could into a bona fide powerhouse, one that regularly challenges big-time studios for box office supremacy and awards season glory. They've done so by continuing to release a near-immaculate slate of films that vary from high-minded genre fare to complex human dramas and comedies and pretty much everything in between. 2016 was the year A24 became a legit player in Hollywood, and not coincidentally, it was also the year the studio released a Barry Jenkins' heartfelt and harrowing coming-of-age drama Moonlight. This film cleaned up at the box office, blew the critics away, and stormed the Oscars by claiming three Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Much has already been said about Moonlight's dramatic virtue and brilliant artistic integrity, but you really can't downplay just how good this movie is. A number of pitch-perfect performances, the stylistic mix of naturalistic and expressionistic photography, and an awe-inspiring original score make Moonlight every bit the immaculate human drama you've heard so much about. If you've yet to experience it for yourself, then don't wait around, because there's really no better time to bask in the lush and lavish glow of Moonlight. In 2015, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead teamed up to release Spring, a wildly innovative Lovecraftian romance about a young man falling in love with a mysterious woman or traveling in Europe. Despite scoring well with critics, however, not many people actually saw it. Those who did likely discovered Spring on Netflix, where the film eventually garnered its well-deserved status as a cult classic. Fans of Spring knew full well what Benson and Moorhead could do, and so they anxiously awaited the pair's next offering. Then, in 2017, they released The Endless, another critically acclaimed genre mashup that follows a similarly grounded, dramatic approach to horror and sci-fi filmmaking. In The Endless, Benson and Moorhead spin a complex tale of two brothers who make the fateful decision to revisit the alien death cult they have managed to escape in their youth. And that's about all you need to know going in, because part of The Endless's narrative magic is found in uncovering the film's unnerving existential mysteries for yourself. Saying more would be like trying to explain an impossible color. It's a mind-bending trip into the unknown, and by the end, you'll be sure of just one thing, that Benson and Moorhead are two of the most daring cult filmmakers of their generation. Few names in the history of cinema inspire as much awe and respect as Martin Scorsese. Now in the fifth decade of his all but unimpeachable career, Scorsese has somehow managed to maintain his fiercely independent vision while cranking out more genuine cinematic masterpieces than, well, pretty much any filmmaker who's ever lived. The Irishman is Scorsese's 26th feature film, and it's certain to go down as one of his late-game masterworks. At three and a half hours, The Irishman is also the longest film of Scorsese's career. Shockingly, however, it seems a film almost never happened, since most studios apparently weren't interested in financing a new Scorsese film with Robert De Niro in the lead. Luckily, Netflix jumped at the chance to add the latest Martin Scorsese picture to their in-house catalog. Anchored by a powerhouse turn from De Niro, The Irishman finds the legendary director in surprise surprisingly subtle form, delivering a melancholic slow burner of a gangster flick culled from a real-life story about ruthless mobsters, fractured families, violence, and betrayal. Yes, The Irishman may look like a typical Martin Scorsese gangster flick, but rest assured, it's anything but. If nothing else, The Irishman is emphatic proof that, even 50 years into his career, Scorsese still has a few tricks up his sleeve. Yes, it seems like Netflix ought to be the streaming service of choice for Scorsese fans. Although today he's a cinematic icon, back in 1976, Scorsese was still a brash young director who had only just become known as an up-and-comer. But Taxi Driver is a film that formally announced Scorsese's arrival in Hollywood, positing the director as both a radical cinematic stylist and a leading voice in 20th century cinema. Oh, and it's also the movie that established Robert De Niro as a once-in-a-generation acting talent, saw a baby-faced Jodie Foster step into the spotlight, and heralded the now-legendary scribe Paul Schrader as one of the best writers in the industry. It also proved a hit with critics, scored respectable numbers at the box office, and earned a handful of Oscar nominations to boot. Today, Taxi Driver is considered one of the most important films ever produced, and it's more than worthy of that praise. The movie's politically charged narrative feels as vital in today's climate as it likely did upon release, and the technical skill behind the production is nothing less than jaw-dropping. Put short, Taxi Driver is essential viewing for anyone who loves movies. The Lobster is without a doubt one of the weirdest movies ever made. It's also one of the funniest, most emotionally devastating movies you'll ever see, and certainly the funniest and most devastating movie you'll ever see about people desperately searching for love to avoid being turned into an animal. 
Yep, you heard that right. The Lobster takes place in a dystopian near future in which single people are rounded up and given 45 days to find true love, or be turned into an animal of their choosing and released into the wild. So yeah, it's pretty weird. But The Lobster is also a cinematic experience unlike any other. Colin Farrell and Rachel Weisz both deliver career-best performances, the script is outright hilarious, and the whole thing somehow comes off as incredibly human and romantic, even though it often feels like it's totally devoid of either romance or humanity. The Lobster is like nothing else out there in the best possible way. The Death of Stalin is a savage, witty, and outlandish comedy, one that continues to beat out the competition years after it left theaters. Written and directed by the legendary satirist Armando Iannucci, The Death of Stalin takes a joyously off-the-wall approach to one of the most deadly periods in the history of the Soviet Union. The movie is led by a stellar cast, including Steve Buscemi, Jeffrey Tambor, and Jason Isaacs. And thanks in part to an immaculate script, it perfectly captures the horror and absurdity of life under a totalitarian regime. Special consideration also has to be given to the movie's superb bombastic score and a downright terrifying performance from Simon Russell Beale, who plays one of the most unsettling movie villains of the last decade. You have a nice long sleep, old man. I'll take it from here. Best of all, however, The Death of Stalin is so jam-packed with subtle gags and witty one-liners that you're bound to enjoy it just as much on the second, third, or even fourth viewing. And with every new watch, the film's utterly absorbing and mile-a-minute narrative carries as much dramatic weight as it does on the first. Hopefully, you've seen at least one of Zhang Yimou's Wushu's wonders over the years. But if you're looking for a gateway into the martial arts director's fantastical cinematic oeuvre, then look no further than the director's tragically overlooked masterpiece 2019's Shadow. Set during China's Three Kingdoms era, Shadow follows a tale of an impetuous king, a brilliant commander, his so-called life Shadow, and a pair of noble women searching for their rightful place in a war-torn world that has little room for them. And then, at the center of it all, is a vicious battle over a hugely important walled city. That's basically all you need to know about Shadow's plot, because the plot isn't really the plot. More than anything, you're better off just sitting back and marveling at the film's awe-inspired photography, mind-boggling set pieces, and sweeping musical flourishes. And hey, if you get swept up in the film's incredible, almost Shakespearean narrative twist along the way, well, all the better. Though he's been working behind the camera for over 20 years, Paul Thomas Anderson has made just eight feature films in that time. And while his fans might argue endlessly over which of his movies is best, Anderson himself appears to have no trouble choosing his favorite. No, it's not Boogie Nights or Phantom Thread or even There Will Be Blood. In fact, PTA's favorite PTA movie is a brilliant and often overlooked 2012 cult drama, The Master. But although The Master is criminally underrated compared to the maestro's other works, there really is a lot to love in this haunting and emotionally raw character to study. The film follows Joaquin Phoenix's scarred and unstable World War II vet, Freddy, as he drifts aimlessly through his post-war life. Fortunes seem to change for Freddy when he meets a charismatic guru, played by the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is spearheading his own spiritual movement. From there, Anderson and company guide the master through a twisted tale of fractured humanity and shifting power dynamics that teeters effortlessly between the weird, the sexual, the horrific, and the metaphysical. In the mix, Anderson draws career best work from his cast and delivers a film more than worthy of adoration from the man who conjured it. Few actors have cast as long a shadow over their craft as Daniel Day-Lewis. Thanks to his fierce dedication to method acting and his uncanny ability to transform himself, body and soul for each new role, he's become one of the most critically acclaimed and famous actors in recent cinema history. Day-Lewis claimed his second of three Best Actor award for his towering work as There Will Be Blood's ruthless turn-of-the-century oil man. And frankly, merely calling Day-Lewis's performance in There Will Be Blood towering seems like an understatement, because Paul Thomas Anderson's film is utterly concerned consumed by Day-Lewis's presence. The beloved actor's near-mythic work in this movie is so utterly transfixing, it's almost easy to lose sight of Anderson's own mastery throughout. Still, even as the preternaturally gifted filmmaker willfully puts his actor's scene devouring turn front and center, he wisely uses it to bolster what's essentially an epic chamber drama about capitalism run amok. This movie is as audaciously ambitious as it is inherently insightful and may just feature the best work to date from both actor and director. 
Over the past few years, Netflix has transformed itself from a streaming service that produces small-scale passion projects into a legit industry powerhouse, one whose artist-friendly approach has drawn talents like the Coen brothers, Alfonso Cuaron, and Steven Soderbergh into the fold. Along the way, it has become a regular awards season player, even making a splash at the Oscars in recent years. Case in point, Noah Baumbach's harrowing relationship dramedy Marriage Story, which was nominated in six categories at the Academy Awards, including four out of the so-called Big Five, Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Original Screenplay. In the end, it took home one statue, Best Supporting Actress for Laura Dern. Baumbach's latest picture also led the pack in terms of nominations at the 2020 Golden Globes, with Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson both landing nods for their performances. And yes, the duo more than earns the praise they've been receiving ever since Marriage Story made its debut on Netflix. Curious to see what the fuss is all about? Give it a go and find out. Would the detour so simple? Would the detour so simple? Keep your head still. Would the detour so simple? Would the detours so simple? The detours so simple. I'm trying to say that, Mr. Lorenz. Since bursting onto the scene with 1984's neo noir stunner Blood Simple, Joel and Ethan Cohen have become poster boys for the Hollywood outsider who have made it big in showbiz, earning a handful of Oscars and waves of critical praise to boot. They've also brought their singular wit and audacious cinematic vision to pretty much every genre under the sun. Quite often, the Cohen brothers have packed several seemingly disparate genres into the same film, essentially concocting their own entirely new genres in the process. But the Coen's uncanny penchant for genre gymnastics has never been so on display as it is in their immaculate skewering of Hollywood's golden age, Hail Caesar. Would the detours the same? 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 Rufo, Rufo, Rufo. Set largely on the back lot of a 1950s movie studio, the movie mainly follows a fixer, played by Josh Brolin, who goes above and beyond in keeping the studio's multiple stars, directors, and productions in check. Hail Caesar finds a Coen's packing literal representations of every genre they can get their hands on into a darkly comical, overarching narrative about Cold War anxieties in mid-century America. While that everything-at-once approach occasionally leaves Hail Caesar feeling a bit unfocused, it still offers ample opportunity for the brothers to show off their razor-sharp writing and their impeccable taste in actors. And though Hail Caesar ranks among the slighter of the Coen's efforts, it also remains one of their most misunderstood and, to some fans, even one of their best. Or so so you could say soulful, rueful, soulful. Would the detours us? Would the detours Would the detours us? Why are you doing this? Would the detours us? Just keep still. After his debut with 2011's marvelously twisted horror Kill List, Ben Wheatley has crafted one of the more colorful resumes in show business. He followed his breakout with a psycho killer romantic romp Sightseers, the psychedelic period horror A Field in England, and the stunning socially conscious satire that is 2015's High Rise. With such a wildly varied slate of films keeping his fans decidedly off balance, Wheatley followed the success of High Rise by once again switching speeds with 2016's action-packed crackerjack crime farce Free Fire. Undoubtedly his highest profile film to date, Wheatley had no doubt earned the right to indulge himself with a little bombast. But Free Fire went big in totally unexpected ways. In fact, with Free Fire, Wheatley went pretty much off the wall nuts, casting an impressive slate of actors and throwing them into a viper pit of a narrative in ways that really have to be seen to be believed. Following an arms deal gone wrong, the entirety of Free Fire's 90-minute runtime unfolds in real time in just a single location, and is mostly taken up by a single epic gun battle. With whole crates of artillery and ammunition to hand, that fight is every bit as wild as you'd hope, and makes for one of the more deliriously brutal, stylish, and funny cinematic releases of the last few years. Though a recent string of critically acclaimed releases has helped reshape the conversation surrounding horror movies, the genre on the whole continues to be viewed as slight and schlocky by snobby cinephiles the world over. Of course, many of those same snobs are quick to hail Jonathan Demme's 1991 Best Picture winner The Silence of the Lambs as a masterpiece, even while refusing to acknowledge it as a horror movie at all. But make no mistake, this is a horror movie to its very core. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. You've probably at least heard of The Silence of the Lambs because its cinematic legacy is pretty much unimpeachable. In case you don't know, the film follows an FBI agent cadet who becomes ensnared in a manhunt for a sadistic killer. To find her murderer, she turns to Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychologist imprisoned for killing and eating his own patients. As the action unfolds, so too does the horror, with Demi crafting an enthralling crime thriller packed with more gore, jump scares, and boogeymen than your average slasher flick and doing so with the grace and vitality of a bona fide cinematic master. 
Perhaps more than any other filmmaker in history, Spike Lee continues to elicit a decidedly visceral reaction from moviegoers. That's very much by design too, as Lee's films are specifically meant to not just push buttons, but to push viewers as far out of their emotional comfort zones as possible. And whether you love or loathe what Spike Lee brings to cinema, few can argue his uncompromising cinematic artistry or his indefatigable flair for biting social drama. Given the state of the world, it should come as no surprise that Lee is pushing boundaries further than ever. He made serious waves with his searing, racially charged 2018 thriller Black Klansman, and Lee got back in the saddle in 2015 with the fevered Vietnam War drama The Five Bloods. Lee's latest follows a group of Vietnam vets who find themselves back in the country decades after the war's end to bring home the remains of their fallen brother and the cache of gold they'd stored away during combat. Equal parts anti-war drama and action-packed treasure hunt adventure, The Five Bloods explores these men in both timelines as they struggle with fighting a war for a country that, even decades later, all but refuses to recognize their sacrifice. Yes, The Five Bloods is as politically and socially motivated as any film Spike Lee has ever made, and it's also a daring, devastating document of the black experience that, frankly, demands to be seen by as many folks as possible. The last half decade hasn't exactly been one to remember for Johnny Depp. It hasn't been a banner few years for his frequent collaborator Tim Burton either. But no matter how far the duo's legacies might have slipped of late, they're still likely to go down as one of the most creatively congruous director-actor combos in movie history. That statement would ring true even if you accounted for Depp's and Burton's collaborations in the 90s alone. They kicked off the decade with the enigmatic suburban satire Edward Scissorhands, following it up with the lovingly twisted biographical dramedy Ed Wood, and then closed the decade out with what might be the most underrated example of their shared cinematic talents. This was 1999's Sleepy Hollow, which found both actor and director delivering a bold reimagining of Washington Irving's iconic tale of terror The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, perhaps better known as The Tale of the Headless Horseman. In the hands of Burton and Depp, that classic story becomes a hyper-stylized steampunk nightmare. One that transforms the cowardly Ichabod Crane into a cunning, turn-of-the-century constable who is dispatched to the titular town to solve a series of grisly murders in which victims are left without their heads. Yes, this story is exactly as thrilling, gory, and glorious as you might think. And even if you are familiar with the well-trod lore behind Sleepy Hollow, it's a surefire guarantee that you've never before seen it told quite like this. For film fans of a certain temperament, Charlie Kaufman's name elicits pangs of pure cinematic bliss. Luckily for them, his latest movie debuted on Netflix in the waning days of summer 2020. For those new to Charlie Kaufman's work, you probably ought to know that you're entering a world rife with emotional turmoil, tragically flawed characters, and wild metaphysical quandaries. Kaufman's movies also burst at the scene with rapturous and often soul-crushing humanity, and the writer-director's new film I'm Thinking of Ending Things is as twisted and soulful as anything he's ever done. It's difficult to explain what I'm Thinking of Ending Things is about, because Kaufman's latest is quite literally about everything. The film follows a young woman hitting the road with her newish partner to meet his parents for the first time. And from that deceptively simple setup, Kaufman delivers a stylishly ambitious, emotionally raw cinematic odyssey that's wonderfully weird and esoterically eerie in ways you just have to see to believe. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.